are live. Welcome to 2007's Beowulf review and thoughts. So, I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie I really loved. This movie, this video will have some jokes and I will get into a number of serious topics. So, the movie is rated PG-13, but my version is the unrated director's cut and would almost definitely get an R rating, and that is the version of the movie that I will be basing this video on. I haven't watched any other version. And let's see. So, yeah, this video will also be R rated. I might talk fast in this video because my back hurts and I'm too stubborn to not record videos. So, that. Yes, so, I've watched this uh, maybe half a dozen times by now, and I first watched it in the year 2010, so when it was relatively recent. Now, let's see. Yes, so, what is this movie about? Welcome to the epic tale of monsters attacking people, making them miserable, but enough about the sexist and ableist reaction that a number of people had to this movie. Seriously though, 507 AD, Denmark is threatened by the giant Grendel. Can the legendary warrior Beowulf succeed where countless other warriors have failed and slay the monster? Yeah, I felt like it had been long enough since I last did a movie dealing with the Danes, for those who don't know, I am Danish. Now, uh, let's see. So, yeah, about the sexism. It's very frustrating how many men drool over Jolie, as if that's the point of the movie, and how many women shame her for plastic surgery instead of criticizing plastic surgery as a whole. I will get into the ableism in the second thoughts section. So... I will not be getting into spoilers before I get into the thoughts section. The review itself will not have any spoilers. Now, I I probably originally, you know, knowing what I was like in 2010, I bought it for the, you know, legendary epic tale aspect. But something I care much more about today and why I'm doing a video on it is the the themes and exploration of them. So, let's see that. Yeah, so, this movie was originally released in 3D. I haven't watched the 3D, so I can't speak to what it's like to watch it in 3D, but, yeah, you know, watching it in 2D, yeah, it does at times get cheesy, call attention to itself, like, a spear will be jutting out directly at the camera. Like, you know, in, instead of the spear just, uh, you know, hovering, it's like right up in the lens and just, yeah. You know, a lot of the time, honestly, the vast majority of the time, it isn't doing that. Now, that brings us to the writing. So, I have to admit, I don't know very much about Neil Gaiman, who wrote the screenplay for this. You know, he's known for comics. I'm not sure I've read any of his comics, though. Uh, despite, you know, I, I read a lot of comics, but I, I haven't read all that I would like to. He wrote the... Yeah, um, let's see. For for the movie Princess Mononoke, the, the anime movie... It, you know, he has a credit as adapted by English version. I haven't watched it in English, so I have no idea if he did a good job on that. Now, uh, yeah, he wrote the novel for Stardust, a movie that I have not watched, and the book for Coraline, a book I have not watched, but I hear is really, really excellent. Uh, let's see. Yeah, really the only thing that he's written that I hear bad things about is Stardust, and... I'm not sure very many of the things are on the writing, so yeah, he has a very good track record, and I do, th th this makes me want to watch more of the stuff that he's written for, and that 
brings us to the other writer, Roger Avery, who I have a love-hate relationship with. I think he did an incredible job writing the screenplay for and directing The Rules of Attraction, which is one of the funniest movies I've ever seen. And intentionally so, for, for those who might not be aware, it is a comedy. It is a very, very black comedy, and just, it's unbelievably funny. And he has a writing credit for Pulp Fiction stories by, you know, he, he did write with Tarantino in Tarantino's early career, and... Yeah, did a great job on that as well. And yeah, I think his writing for this is really strong as well. But he also wrote Silent Hill, which is just a bafflingly poor adaptation. Like, there's a lot of video games where you really do have to change a lot in order to make it a movie. But the first Silent Hill game? I mean, really, all you gotta do is, is trim it down a bit... You don't have to change very much to make it work. And instead of making an adaptation that would be you know, very accurate and, and deeply compelling, because that first... Like, I'm not saying that the Silent Hill games are perfect. You know, certainly not all of them. Once you get past the third, they're no longer perfect. But that first game has a story that is so easy to translate into a movie... I don't know why they made all these changes, and I've seen interviews, like, apparently he just didn't understand the story of the game, so he just changed it, and it's like, look, we've all been, like, you know, stuck having to do homework for a, a you know, a piece of original content that we didn't completely understand, but, like, you're not in school anymore, you can just say, I'm not the right person to do this adaptation, like, did he really need the, the credit that badly? Like, this was after the Rules of Attraction, the, the, you know, he had proven that he could do something really strong, like, I could maybe understand if this was the first post-Tarantino thing, so he had to prove that he wasn't, you know, just using Tarantino's name to make a career, but, like, and I realize not everybody loves the Rules of Attraction, but I think the people who don't love it are the people who just aren't in the audience for it. Like, I don't think I've encountered anyone who is in the exact right audience for it and who didn't at least really, really enjoy it. You know, yeah. Anyway, so the poem was made from a story that was originally shared through oral tradition, a very long lasting tradition some pe some couples would share it with each other at the same time today we can take care of it quickly with our hands now Roger Avery and Neil Gaiman talk on the DVD about how they felt free to change the story since it was changed so many times over the hundreds of years since it was written and I have to completely agree I really don't think it makes very much sense to that's that's one of the there's a lot of people who did not like this movie who point primarily to the fact that it is very unlike the original poem. And I don't know why these people don't just go and read the poem. Like, it's not like when they made this movie, they burnt all copies of the poem. So just, yeah. But yeah, it definitely, it changes some things and I I do not think it would be particularly interesting to just do a straight adaptation of the poem. We we no longer need the kinds of stories that it you know the the that it fits into. We need more deconstruction today and that is you know a lot of what this does. And the Ah, let's see, there was one more thing I really wanted to... Um, let's see, the changes to the story and the... Right, right, yeah. The, the 1999 Beowulf also does try to change some things to, to you know, 
yeah, to not just be a straight adaptation, that one is not as intelligent and interesting as this. But it's it's fun if you just want, you know, something that follows the basic story and yeah, it's fun. It stars Christopher Lambert. I, I don't think I need to tell you more than just that. It's very funny reading negative reviews of this that talk about how full of debauchery it is. What did you expect based on that time and setting exactly? All things considered, it's very toned down and restrained, but it is a hardly a surprise that Avery would put as much sex and booze into a movie like this, considering the rules of attraction. And, yeah, so this, I, yeah, I believe this was actually a professional critic, so, yeah, direct quote. The bane of English majors for 1,300 years makes it back to the screen now with 75% more hostility towards Christianity. He did end up giving it a, a 4 out of 5. I really hope that dude was just joking, but American Christians have such a victim complex. Dude, there are thousands of movies that are preaching Christianity, a number of them in subtle ways. This is one of a statistically insignificant amount that are, perhaps, and I'm not sure I agree that it is, critical. I, I would rather, the way I see it, the movie compares Christianity to pagan religions. Including the belief in the, well, actually, yeah, wait. Does that qualify as paganism? Um, yeah. Belief in the in the Norse myths. You know, it, it compares and contrasts them. I wouldn't really say that it, it straight up criticizes. Yeah. Now, let's see. Right, so, yeah, some MDB trivia quotes. The movie adds extra dimensions and speculations to the original story as the film authors found the original poem to be an episodic list of monster battles with little character development or building towards a goal. They added in several psychological conflicts. When Neil Gaiman co-wrote this movie, people thought he said Baywatch. Wow. Yeah, not sure I see Neil Gaiman writing Baywatch. And let's see. Co-screenwriter Roger Avery directed a musical version of Beowulf for the Parisian stage after his debut movie, Killing Zoe. Interesting. Now, let's see. Right, so, yeah. Screenwriters Neil Gaiman and Roger Avery met after Avery became the writer for a proposed movie adaptation of Gaiman's acclaimed Sandman graphic novel. Gaiman loved his script, but the studio found it too weird, which... Okay, so, it was... Then it was definitely a game, and yeah. And had Avery replaced with Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio, finding their sensibilities very compatible, the pair went in 1997 on a vacation to Baja, Mexico, where they sequestered themselves in the hotel room and didn't leave until they had something. That something ended up being Beowulf's first draft. Screenwriters Roger Avery and Neil Gaiman's original plan was for Avery to direct on a modest, modest budget. He had storyboarded several scenes and had a few European lo shooting locations scouted. His intended style would have been heavily influenced by Roman Polanski's Macbeth from 1971 and Terry Gilliam's Jabberwocky from 1977. However, studios were unable to see the potential with his intended vision, so he ended up selling the project to Robert Zemeckis. And let's see... Yeah, Avery wanted to make a small-scale gritty film with a budget of 15 to 20 million Similar to Jabberwocky or Excalibur. And let's see. Yeah, and Zemeckis asked producer Steve Bing to revive the production, convincing Avery that Zemeckis' vision, supported by the strength of digital enhanced live action, was worth relinquishing the directorial reins. It would have been very interesting to see a version of this. 15 to 20 million, gritty, directed by 1990s Roger Avery. Ni 1990s or early 2000s Roger Avery, you know, before the 2006 Silent Hill adaptation that he wrote. Because of the expanded budget, Zemeckis told the screenwriters to rewrite their script, because there is nothing that you could write that would cost more than a million per minute to film. Go wild. And, oh, that's right, yeah, yeah, um, the climactic 
yeah, the, the climax was originally a completely, yeah, it, it was, it was changed dramatically. And, let's see. Right, some credit quotes. Avery and Gaiman lay on the sexual innuendo and adultery, fleshing out the character of Beowulf into a believably unreliable narrator. And let's see. Director Robert Zemeckis has delivered a stirring update of the 1300-year-old epic poem in a way that actually connected to, a, to contemporary audiences. He fills it with passion and fire and savage energy, with considerable help from co-collaborator Neil Gaiman, whose understanding of myth mythology's psychological foundations is matched only by his talent for rendering it with exquisite storytelling symmetry. And let's see. Right, and that brings us to direction. So this was directed by Robert Zemeckis. And I have not watched that much of his... Let's see, okay, so after this, he directed A Christmas Carol, which also uses the, the animation, the, you know, a, a, an upgraded version of the animation of this. I think it's upgraded. I forget. I only watched it once, and that was 13 years ago, so, yeah. And, let's see... Right, Death Becomes Her, which I do think is is quite fun. I I don't personally love the, the sexism in it, but apparently, like, the gay community, according to Ryan Tasmo, the gay community love it, so, you know, I can... I can that's that's great. It it's uh, yeah. I watched his Back to the Future movies and Who Framed Roger Rabbit and yeah, I know you don't have to tell me I you know yeah. Uh let's I'll I'll just I'll brief I'll save you the trouble. You don't have to put in the comments. I know that I'm supposed to also have watched Cast Away Contact Forrest Gump and Romancing the Stone, and some would add what lies beneath to that. But, uh, let's see. Yeah, so, the movie does deliver the testosterone-driven male power fantasy, but there is more going on than that. And I really appreciate, like, a lot of directors would only have really been able to grasp on to the, the power fantasy aspect, and would not have been able to deliver on all the other, you know. So, yeah, it's it's very impressive that he clearly, Zemeckis, understood what they were going for. Because he does, you know, the whole movie is big and, like, full of, full of energy and life. And it doesn't die down when it's talking about more complex topics. It just... It handles them in a in a you know in a slightly different way, but not lacking the passion, which you know he uh, yeah yes. So uh, I'm going to do a quick rundown of the worst criticisms I've heard of this movie. They turned it into an action movie. It's a story about a hero who slays monsters. Were you expecting an indie drama? The poem has Christian references, but the characters aren't Christian, but party loudly make sexual references, etc. Denmark was not Christian when the story was set. The Christianity in the poem was added by Christians long after the events that it's about, after Denmark became Christian. Let's see. And yeah, there you know, there are definitely a lot of people dancing in this. I guess no one in Denmark back then had two left feet, which is good. If you have two left feet, that means you can't walk right. Now, I guess I sh will, yeah, I have other things that fit in other parts of this review. So, yeah, the opening, you know, at, at the very, I think the, the, the first shot is basically just this, you know, 
like it's it's attractive but it's just it's a still shot and then it starts getting into into motion and like yeah the opening of the film really sets the tone like if you're watching this and you if if like the first 10 minutes of this movie really put you off you might not want to keep watching because it really sets the tone like immediately it is completely unashamed so I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits with what came before. I think it's a perfect ending. There's no Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. And... Yeah, so... Yeah, as, as an adaptation, you know, in some ways it is a loose adaptation, but it's not like the movie prevents you from just going and reading the original if that's what you want to do. And there are other adaptations. It's, you know, they also didn't destroy every copy of all the other adaptations. I haven't watched, I think the only two versions of Beowulf I've watched are this and the 2009, 1999 movie, that's it. But there are many other versions I would be shocked to my core if there is not at least one version that is just a very straight adaptation of the original poem i that would i would not be able to believe the the, the yeah that brings us to the characters so ray winstone stars as beowulf and so, yeah, Zemeckis cast Winstone after seeing his performance as the title character of the 2003 ITV serial Henry VIII. And, let's see... And, oh, right, on the topic of the original poem, Winstone commented during an interview, I had the beauty of not reading the book, which I understand portrays Beowulf as a very one-dimensional kind of character. A hero and a warrior, and that was it. I didn't have any of that baggage to bring with me. And, let's see... Unlike some of his castmates, Winstone's animated counterpart bears little resemblance to the actor who was in his early 50s when he filmed the role. Winstone noted that his computer-generated counterpart resembled himself at the age of 18, although the filmmakers did not have a photo for reference. Let's see... And... Right, so... Yes, critic quotes, It is Grendel, perhaps, who makes the most obvious case for using motion capture in a film like this, given that the huge and horrible Grendel could never be created so convincingly using practical effects. But it is Beowulf himself that benefits the most, for one can always make a monster one way or another, but how do you find a six-foot-six-inch blonde male with an incredible six-pack for abs who can do his own stunts and give a compelling performance. I mean, as much as we all loved Arnie in Conan the Barbarian, neither he nor his accent fit my own idea of the character. In Beowulf, a talented... Yeah, uh, I'm not gonna... Let's see. Yeah, a talented actor of average height is able to become a ferocious warrior. Now that is a great special effect. And multiple people thought it was really, really funny that he, you know, he uses his original, let's, uh, yeah, marvelous, marvelous other, also to have a gruff-voiced working, working class North London hero voiced by Ray Winstone. I came to kill your monster. And it's, yeah, I, I, I really love that they didn't, because if he has to do an accent, then a lot of his attention goes towards maintaining that accent. They didn't ask him to change his accent at all, and it really shows in his performance. He is, like, just, yeah, he's, he's literally roaring with life in this movie. Given that Ray looks very little like the character, animation was the only way he would be able to play this character, and I think that by itself is a really strong argument for the movie being fully animated. It would be weird if everyone else was played by a human and he was the only animated character, and he is an incredible actor. His performance is very strong in this. And, you know, before you say, well, who would make a, a movie where just, a, you know, some of the characters were animated but the rest is live action, well... You know, you have the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, the, the more recent movies. 
you know, I, I'm not saying that the ones they made in the 90s were perfect, but it did feel less awkward. I, I haven't watched the, the new, uh, the last Turtles movie I watched was the 2007 animated one. You know, and yeah, I, I say practical suits or all animation, but don't do animated turtles and then have normal people standing there. It's just, I, I think it was Phelous who pointed out how, how awkward it is and how he thought that it should just be all animation. And let's see. Yeah, so Crispin Glover and... Hmm. I think I might actually keep that... Yeah. Crispin Glover plays Grendel, the antagonist, and Glover had previously worked with Zemeckis in Back to the Future. You know, the, the first one, when he portrayed George McFly, Zemeckis had found Glover tiresome on set because of his lack of understanding of shooting a film, but realized this would not be a problem, as on motion capture, he could choose his angles later. And, yeah, um, Crispin Glover has dialogue that's in Old English, and he delivers it like he's been speaking it since childhood. He really does an incredible job. And, let's see... Yes, this is probably my favorite performance of his. I do think he's good in Back to the Future, the first one. I think it's shameful how he was replaced in the second one, especially the reason why he was replaced in the second one. And I do think he is really good in the Charlie's Angels movies, but he is incredible here. Both the physical and the vocal performance just... And, and you know, going by behind the scenes, when you see the character move in the movie, it is actually mocap. That's not movement animation. And let's see... Yeah, the... I don't think I want to talk about what she plays, but Angelina Jolie does have a important role in this, and you know it's it's really frustrating that so many people focus on her appearance. If you look past that, she gives an incredible performance in this. I, I think it was I think it was Clint Eastwood who pointed out that. You know, it's too bad that she is so beautiful because a lot of people are not going to look past that. This is she, is... she is an incredible actress. She's given such compelling performances. I think it maybe helps... You know, if, if you're someone who struggles with looking past her appearance, try to watch Changeling. Because that's very much a movie that doesn't really use her appearance much at all you know she is dressed very conservatively which considering when it's set makes perfect sense you know that back then you really wouldn't have seen some and and she's she's like a um middle class woman if i recall so, something like she's you know so she would be expected to dress like that and at that point you really can't see anything other than the performance and it really is just like and and it's such a it's such a daring performance also because there are you know she used to be this huge you know glamorous hollywood star sex symbol and in that movie she allows herself to be seen in in ways that you know are not conventionally attractive and yeah it's very very gutsy uh, you know just yeah and in general, a quite good movie also. But then, you know, yeah, I might as well just have said it, you know, it was directed by Clint Eastwood, then you know it's good. And yes, Anthony Hopkins plays King Hrothgar. And let's see, yeah, Hopkins noted in an interview since Segmas Se Zemeckis is an American, he wasn't certain what accent Hopkins should use for the role of Hrothgar. Hopkins told him, well, Welsh would be my closest because that's where I come from. It was also his first time working with motion capture technology, and let's see... Yeah, Hopkins noted, I didn't know what was expected. It was explained to me, I'm not stupid, but I still don't get the idea of how it works. I have no idea. You don't have sets, so it is like being in a Brecht play, you know, with just bare bones and you have nothing else. And let's see... Yeah, he did not read the original poem in school, and let's 
see. John Malkovich plays Unferth, and he is excellent. And just... Yeah. Um, the the Which, again, I, I don't know why I even bothered... John Malkovich appears in this. Of course he's amazing, but but yeah, just also one of his one of his best. It's not one of his biggest roles, but it is among his best work. Brendan Gleeson plays Wiglaf, Beowulf's lieutenant, and yeah, again, it to be fair, I think Brendan Gleeson has some of the roles, it's not his fault, but some of them he has been directed to act in a kind of awkward way that but but yeah. Here he is really, really solid. Robin Wright Penn plays Queen Welthow, and yeah, it's really, really, yeah, deeply compelling performance. Now, uh, Alison Lohman plays Ursula, and I have to admit, I, I'm not sure, I don't think I've seen her in very much, but she does well in this. And, let's see, yeah, so, that brings us to the dialogue, so, yeah, there's, uh, there's not a huge amount of Old English spoken, but this is definitely, I, I don't know, you know, I always watch with, with subtitles, even when I speak the language fluently, like with English, but, I, yeah, they probably put subtitles for the Old English, even if you don't yourself put subtitles on the movie, because it is definitely important that you understand what is said, but it's, yeah, not a huge amount is, is spoken. Now, there are 52 entries in the IMDb quote section. Most of it is good, and yeah, the, the you know, they, they talk... Like, I already mentioned that people basically just go with their original accent, but the lines are these, you know, like, there's a lot of bragging, and they, you know, they, yeah, the lines really paint a picture. Occasionally, literally, will, like, as they're saying something, you'll see, an, you know, a rendition of what they're describing, but it is, like, ah, what's the word? Yeah, they they use fancy words to really describe how amazing they are or something else is and, and such. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say there's a huge amount where people talk the way they do in real life, but it's not really that kind of movie. Like, I, I would say this is legitimately, like, and, and the movie makes it clear from very early on that it is, this is a an uh, um, a, a myth or a legend being retold. It's just the 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 values of it are different than the original poem, but it is still an an epic being retold. We, you know, there are certain things in this that it's like, okay, that is that did not actually happen. Now, this is one of those where. Uh, let's see. Oh, right, there is there is there is a listed director of photography for this, Robert Presley, and he is basically ah oh, that's right yeah he's he's cinematographer on yeah so Polar Express this Christmas Carol and Mars Needs Moms I think that last one is also fully animated so yeah and otherwise he has twenty eight credits as camera department on movie three for tv one for video and let's see yeah so the camera moves in very elaborate ways it reminds me very much of the of the camera of brian de palma both have an affinity for long unbroken shots some pan across what is happening certainly both are great at capturing the mood but at its best, De Palma's camera is more motivated than the camera often is in this movie. And it is the kind of thing where you kind of wonder... Because, like, at the end of the day... 
Zemeckis has to approve the work of the director of photography, it makes you wonder if he always wanted this kind of thing and it's just usually he was constrained by technology because there are, you know, Brian De Palma, like, especially in some of his most recent movies, like the, the Black Dahlia, he can pull ridiculous moves with his camera and it still tends to be rooted in, it, it still tends to be motivated, you know? It's not really just look at what we can do, which at times in this movie it basically is. Like the... I, I don't, I, I think you, you can go as wild with your camera as you want, but I do think it loses something if the camera moves are not motivated. And, you know, I, for example, like, the, there's some, there's some completely ridiculous cinematography in the two Crank movies, but if you look at it, it, it very frequently is motivated, like, in the first crank, when when Jason Statham wakes up and realizes the dire situation he's in, like he has a headache, like uh, uh, he's he is basically hungover, and he realizes he has very little time, so he runs down a hallway to get to where he's going, and instead of just like the camera running alongside him, which would capture the energy. The, the, one of the two directors, I forget which of them, strapped on a pair of roller blades, and with a handheld camera, I, I want to say he starts behind um, Statham, and he rollerblades past him, and then ahead of him, still holding the camera, and I think we can probably agree that's pretty ridiculous. That's very unusual cinematography. But it does make sense. You know, it, it captures how disorienting. It, you know, he's he just woke up. He realizes he's in this bad situation. He has a headache. He's hungover. And he has to hurry. So he just bolts. And it's like, whoa, okay, uh, whew. You know, you could you could do it just by shaking the camera or just a close up of his face, just going ugh. But doing that, cinematography, yeah, as as cinematography, it really really works. It puts you right there, and that is like, not all cinematography and editing put you right in the inside the head of the person of of the protagonist. But sometimes it can be really useful to do that. And sometimes in this, they just kind of, like, very early on, there's these shots of the of the party, and when it's just moving around the party, you know, it, it's, it captures the, the atmosphere of the party. And then it wants to convey that there is great distance between the party and Grendel, and it basically, I mean, it's... It, I guess it is a... See, if you... Yeah, if, if you... If you wanted to do it old school, it would have to be a dolly shot. So let's say the camera dollies out. And... Dolly shots can be extremely useful, but here it just... It isn't... It doesn't really... Yeah, You know, it... it it has the benefit that it keeps you within it 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 avoids cutting because the moment that you cut uh, you know a, a man who taught me a lot about you know filmmaking i i'm going to i'm doing i'm going to quote him directly when you cut between one shot and another no time maybe no time passed maybe an immense amount of time passed, you know, and, and like, if you want the audience to know, obviously, you'll want to make sure that we you know, but it, you know, cut, cutting does inherently, it, it, it's difficult to cut and not remove us from the, the thing, so, yeah, instead, they do it with the camera, and it actually, it does remind me of at least one shot in the, the, 
the Black Dahlia, but in the Black Dahlia, it basically it 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 serves to connect what the the two different uh, you know situations because it is important to do so and it does so without sacrificing you know here in this movie it does basically sacrifice like you you watch it and it's like oh that's not completely you know it doesn't yeah and let's see because you know if you look at uh, you know yeah i already mentioned which movies i've watched by him but by zemeckis and yeah, this and Christmas Carol are the only ones where I thought that the the cinematography ever really got, like... Uh, I guess the word is full of itself, you know? It, it's kind of just showing off. And at the, at the cost of, uh, you know, yeah, reminding the audience that it's... Yeah, so, so you know, it's a it's a reminding the audience that this was made by technology. You know, this was not filmed on an actual set because cameras can't move like that. And you know, it, it works for the atmosphere, but you know, conveying the distance it suffers. And yeah, it makes you wonder if Zemeck has always wanted to do that kind of cinematography, but was just limited by technology. Which brings us to the editing. Now, this is also... Oh, actually, yeah, this, this guy, uh, Jeremiah O'Driscoll, I think some of this... Huh. Actually, come to think of it, I cannot say for sure if any of this was not done in animation. But yeah, he did... He edited Polar Express, Beowulf, and Christmas Carol. So, yeah. Which also does tell you that Zemeck has liked his work on this to keep him, uh, you know... Yeah, so... The editing... There is some really great stuff in the editing, and I would definitely say this is not a movie that needed trimming down, for example. There's no scene that should just be removed. Um, I, I totally get, you know, some people will find some scenes in this obnoxious, but you have to really, you know, and, and you know, I'm not to... As a straight white cis man, I do enjoy the power of fantasy... I'm not saying if you know if you're if you live in a, if you're a minority a member of a minority group and you find it really distasteful I'm not telling you that you have to like it. And uh, but but yeah, you know, it it doesn't you know quite go go overboard which I would say for example movies like Van Helsing and the first GI Joe live action movie you know both by Steven Sommers I think he pushes things too far, and it gets to be unintentionally funny. Which, during this movie, if you're laughing, it's because you're meant to, uh, most likely. And there are some really compelling match cuts. Uh, there's this really early scene where, you know, Beowulf is talking about this swimming match, and the camera is focusing on Beowulf, and the camera tilts. And then there's a match cut to him swimming. So basically, it doesn't... Like, he remains the same in both shots, except, you know, instead of standing, he's, you know, he's swimming with his arms. But everything around him changes. That's a very effective match cut. And it, you know, that's the kind of thing. I, I wish that... That was how it conveyed the, the distance, that it used a match cut instead. But, yeah. Let's see. And I do, you know, I do really appreciate that the first time it's a, you know, I, I don't know if I would necessarily call it a slow dolly, but it is not, like, extremely fast of a dolly to, to go between, 
the, the where the the party is going on and then Grendel later there's a party in that same place and you know we know that's gonna you know we saw how Grendel reacted last time we we know that there's gonna be a reaction this time you know again instead of doing the same which again some directors would have been like no 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 let's let's really drink it no no, no. We know where it's going, so it's just a really, really quick... Like, I think it takes, like, a couple of seconds, this this dolly, so, which, you know, yeah. Don't watch this movie if you already have a headache. This is not the... This is not going to make things any better. So, the... Let's see, that brings us to the animation. So, yeah, the, the animation sets and maintains moods and is visually impressive while the animation isn't completely convincing in photo reel especially when it comes to the eyes although let's see yes yeah, so, some did say some some critics did say luckily Zemeckis has gotten rid of the dead eye syndrome that plagued the polar express having only seen clips of that i can't say for sure it looks to me like it's a little better here but it's there's still some issue the lighting and level of detail are impressive, and most of the main cast gives strong performances despite them filming in a mocap room with, you know, set and props or bright green or red or the like. Like, if they pick up a leg of chicken to bite, it doesn't actually look like a leg of chicken. It's wireframe, but with string that you can bite into because this was filmed before COVID. Though they did apparently use real horses at least some of the time. And, yeah, the the... Now that the movie is 15 years old, the conversation about the movie is no longer about whether or not it will be the next big thing in movies, whether or not that would be a good thing or a bad thing. As much as I love the movie, I am relieved that not every movie is like this now, you know, which I realize, you know, today it might seem sound ridiculous, but keep in mind, all movies used to be in black and white, you know. Imagine, like, today it's still possible, like The Lighthouse, you know, but... And, and Sin City, but imagine if all movies were still black and white. It would be completely just, yeah. Uh, all movies used to be silent movies, you know. So sometimes something comes along and completely changes everything. And I, yeah, I'm glad that this wasn't one. I really, I think there is something that is Im maybe not impossible, but extremely difficult to replicate in animation that you get from having an actual actor interacting with props and sets or even location with other actors um, and, you know, where at least some of it was clearly done. Like, of course, if you have action scenes, you're going to have stunt doubles and such, but, and, and these days also some animation to, to help, you know, transition sometimes. But yeah, there's just there's just something about looking at actually being able to see a human face moving and and acting. Now let's see. Ah, uh, yeah. Since the I'm not gonna quote the entire wiki. There's a lot on Wikipedia for, on the Wikipedia article for this particular movie about the technology. I'm not gonna get into all that. Now, let's see, um, right, so, critic quote, there are always things getting thrown through the air that have no weight to them, but at least we have the complexity of animation and the subtlety of an Anthony Hopkins performance, and you can do really long takes with the camera moving in ways that you couldn't possibly do in live action. Let's see, and... Yeah, so the, um, yeah, um, and it do, you know, there are some issues when it animates things. I would say fire tends to look pretty good. Sometimes blood, you know, liquid, it's a little bit off. And, yeah, there's some really excellent stunts. Obviously, it's not as easy to appreciate since everything is animation. But, again, you know, yeah, if, if you really want to appreciate the stunts, the DVD has, like, behind the scenes. And you get to see them 
actually doing I forget if there's any stunts in there but there's definitely you see that they're actually moving now and yeah so this is estimated to have had a budget of 150 million and it underperformed at the box office having earned only 196.4 million now let's see but it did rank number one in U.S. and Canada box office during its opening weekend. And let's see. And and for sure, like, obviously, 15-year-old animation, it's not going to look as good today as, as it did back then. Or, or uh, yeah, you know. You got to be careful when you're, when you're comparing stuff like that. Because... A, there, there have been a huge, like, a lot changes in computer graphics in, you know, ev even in much in a much shorter period of time than fifteen years, you know, but a lot of it does still like they didn't they didn't push that many things too far into something that didn't look good. I would say that, I mean, I suppose that's not the only reason why they don't show that much blood. It's probably also for the rating. But it does actually, yeah, you know, it's one of those things where, uh, what, are, what are they, what do y'all call that in English? Happy accident, I think. Um, you know, in Danish, we'd say that, hit uh, hit, which basically translates to, a fortunate thing from an unfortunate thing, but I don't think y'all say that. So yeah, the the yes, the fact that it doesn't show a huge amount. Although it, yeah, sometimes when there there's a, at least one scene of sailing, and some of that doesn't look completely as good as uh, you know. But but yeah, liquid very difficult, but. By and large, it tends to show things that look pretty good. Like, it's it's stuff like hands and eyes that don't look completely convincing. But, and, and you know, that is obviously, that's not nothing. Uh, hands and eyes are some of the things we, you know, we communicate a lot through. So it's it's a problem for the movie. But... It's not as big of a problem as it could be. And, yeah, this was filmed on... In in studio in California. And... Yeah, so... The... Yeah, since it's animation, you know, we see a lot of different parts of Denmark in the immediate surround... And the immediate surroundings... In AD 507, a mead hall, the sea on, above, and underwater, the surrounding forest area, both when things are going well and things are going badly, mountains, a castle, a watery cavern, just, yeah. And, and this is really a movie that makes you feel like sometimes it's really gross, sometimes it's, you know, more appealing, like, you know, yeah, some of the, some of the stuff they're eating looks quite tasty and the you know yeah when when someone is hit like not all the time but at its best it really feels like you just you sit there and you just oof that must have hurt and just yeah the the manipulation of bodies which considering that the story is about a monster is not a spoiler the manipulation of bodies delivers some really gut-wrenching stuff, you know, and, and again, I can only speak to the unrated director's cut. I have no idea how the PG-13, uh, yeah. Now, uh, right, I've seen some critics say that the movie isn't scary. Uh, you know, I, I can't speak to the PG-13, but other than that, like, the, the unrated is, it has some really, really intense, scary scenes. And the action is great. Um, there's some, there's some chasing. There's some physical fights. You know, just 
yeah, uh, you get to see a lot of different weapons, you know, spears, swords. Uh, is there maybe at least one knife? Uh, I struggle to recall, but, you know, uh, uh, axes, uh, just, yeah. And there's also, there's a really good amount of action, like, um, it opens with a really big scene, and the, yeah, it, it opens big and ends big, and in between, it's not always, like, huge, like the start and finish, but it never... It never gets like small and and just nothing, uh, you know. It's it's never just, yeah. And not every you know, not all of the big scenes you know. Let, not yeah. Some some is partying, some is action, some is horror. But there's always something, you know. The the movie doesn't. There's never a huge amount of time. Of, in a, in a row in the movie where it's like nothing big is is happening, you know. I I think uh, the word operatic is fair to use about this. Now, the score was composed by Alan Silvestri, and I'm just really quickly going to, ah. Why would I be looking for Alan Seller when I nah, whatever? Alan Silvestri. And, yeah, you know, the, the, the two of them had worked before, and, yeah, it's, it's really no wonder. He's, he's responsible for some really excellent scores. So, yeah, and he does really great work here. Um, big music, like, epic kind of just, yeah, epic fantasy feel, and... Some of the soundtrack is actually here on YouTube free to listen to. You know, it's well worth listening to. And let's see. Yeah, and some of the actors actually sing in, in the movie as well. Some have said the soundtrack is perfect, which, yeah, that's... And, yeah, one... This is... This is a really good description. Crashing over the top score and power ballad. Yes, that is exactly right. Now, the... Right, and the... Let's see... Um... Okay, there's at least one critic who really did not think much of the sound design. I mean, I can only really imagine that... It was badly that that it, they fixed it for the director's cut, because yeah, I th I thought they they did great. Like you you know, the the sound design really is like if something is if something is small, you don't hear that much sound from it. But the bigger it is, the more noise it makes. And there are some big things again. Grendel is a giant. Not spoiling anything here, and yeah, you know. Let's see, and uh, let's see. that brings us to, yes, the, uh, yeah, the movie is an hour, 41 and a half minutes long without end credits, and an hour and 50 minutes long with them, and there's no post credit scene or something, but some of the ending credits has some music playing over it that is that that does sound really great but yeah you know i don't i think eventually the at least some of them well yeah the, the music is you know if you like the music while watching the movie you might want to you know not necessarily like sit still for it but have it running in the background you know until it's done so the best element for this is tied between the intelligent commentary and just the 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 way it really feels like this big epic adventure you know and yeah i would i would say it's worth watching at least once just to experience those two and i'm very glad i own it i would definitely you know if yeah if you liked it 
this is a movie you can watch over, you know, I, let's see, when did I last watch it? Maybe half a year ago, and I still really enjoyed it. You know, there are some movies that can only survive a single viewing. And if you try to watch them a second time, you're like, what did I like about this? Wow. Now, um, you know, yeah, this came after the Zack Snyder movie 300, and you can definitely tell that... Yeah, the, some of this is definitely in, informed by that. But where that movie doesn't really have anything particular to... You know, it's, it's a very, very well... It's, it's, it's extremely refined as a male power fantasy, but it really doesn't have anything other than a male power fantasy. There's, there's nothing else in there, you know. And, yeah, so... I really appreciate that this wasn't just, and, and I did, I saw some reviews that didn't seem to appreciate that, that just said, oh, it's just, it's, it's 300 over again, and just, I have to vehemently disagree with them. Yeah, the worst aspect is the, the issues with the animation, such as the dead eyes, or not, not completely dead eyes, but the eyes don't have as much life as the actual, yeah. Uh... But, you know, ultimately, I don't think it's that big of a deal. In my opinion, this is like... So, yeah. Um, I don't think the... What was it called? High frame rate. 48 frames per second instead of the usual 24. That didn't really take off as far as I know. But, you know, when you... If you sat down and watched one of the Hobbit movies at high frame rate... It takes maybe 30 minutes, bet between 20 and 30 minutes, I would say, before you just become used to it, and then the rest of it you can enjoy. And yeah, at the very start, it does. it's a little awkward, and you're aware that you're watching something, but afterwards, you're like, wow, that was, you know, that's my personal experience, at least. I would say, for the animation in this, it tends to be the same. Give it 20, 30 minutes, you know, to... to become used to it, and then, you know, it's, I mean, to me personally, like, I also try to watch, when I hear a specific silent movie, a specific black and white sound picture is especially good, I try to sit down and watch it, and you just, you, you get used to it, you know, or you can't get used to it, and you find yourself really, really hating the experience, obviously, if that's what it is for you, I'm not gonna tell you that you have to sit through you know, an hour and 50 minutes of this. Well, yeah, an hour and 41 and a half without end credits. So the worst aspect, according to others, is that it's too inaccurate to the original, and I don't think that's a big deal. I don't think it's a small deal. I don't think it's a deal. I think you got ripped off. Now, yeah, so the thing I was most worried about was that the Con that the effect would be unconvincing, and ultimately the movie did slightly exceed my expectations. The thing I was most looking forward to was Neil Gaiman's writing, and the movie exceeded my expectations. And that... Yeah, so the trailers do give at least a little bit too much away. I think they could have gotten audience interest without spoiling, but... You know, at the same time, if you like the trailer, you're more likely to like the movie than if you do not. Uh, the cover and poster give a little bit too much away. And that brings us to... Yeah, so when I searched on here on YouTube for stuff for this, I found 10 clips, 1 trailer, 12 tribute videos set to hard rock metal and the like that makes a lot of sense i think that might be you know, yeah yeah in in some way that might be its most enduring legacy the the male power fantasy aspect and how well this pairs you know and there is some hard rock in the movie as well you know that yeah i wish that it was the commentary but i i can admit it was it, that's probably what you know uh, one reaction, one vlog review, one video review, and one set of interviews. So, you know, not a lot of people, like, picking it apart as what does it have to say to people. 
And I think part of that is probably a lot of people just... And that's also some. I don't think the trailer really tells you, no, 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 this has something to say. It's not just... Because, yeah, you know, at this point, like, people... People were thinking 300, and before that, there was Sin City, which also doesn't really deconstruct. It's just a really strong example of what it is, you know, but it doesn't especially deconstruct the things that it... the, the elements of the, of the movie. It plays them straight, but, you know, yeah. So, on Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 71% on the tomato meter based on 196 reviews only a 50 percent audience score okay uh based on 200 over 250,000 ratings and the critics consensus goes featuring groundbreaking animation stunning visuals and a talented cast beowulf has in spades what more faithful book adaptations forget to bring pure cinematic entertainment absolutely so the yeah the seventy one percent you know the the average rating was six point fifty out of ten, and out of one hundred ninety six reviews, one hundred thirty nine of them were fresh, and yeah so the the audience score right and yeah that means that it is overall fresh not certified fresh but also not rotten, and the audience score you know the average rating was three point two out of five. Only 50% gave it 3.5 or higher out of 5. And on Metacritic, this has a 59 out of 100 and the for, for critics. And the user rating is 6.3 out of 10. 35 Metacritic reviews, 134 user reviews. And on IMDb, it has... 565 IMDb user reviews, and let's see, I forget if I ended up reading all of them or just the top 100, but of the top 100, 25 gave it 1 out of 10, 7 gave it 2, 3 gave it 3, 5 gave it 4, 11 gave it 5, 10 gave it 6, 10 gave it 7, 10 gave it 8, 11 gave it 9, 13 gave it 10. So, yeah, you know, overall, you know, that's pretty positive. But that is to 25, a fourth of the 100 most popular user reviews on IMDb absolutely hated it. And, yeah, um, like, you know, like I said, a lot of it, that is that they, they really hate that it is inaccurate to the the poem so 112 of the 288 links in the imdb external reviews section worked and were in english and on imdb it has a rating of 6.3 out of 10 based on 167,202 imdb users voting and the yeah so 24.8 gave it 7, 23.9 gave it 6, 13.3 gave it 5, 13.3 gave it 8, 6.2 gave it 4, 5.3 gave it 10, 4.8 gave it 9, 3.3 gave it 3, 2.1, oh, and 3.1 gave it 1, 2.1 gave it 2. So, yeah, a lot of people really, really hate it. Now... Right, something I didn't really mention about the, the violence before. Some of the time the violence is, you know, cool and you really want to see, you know, because, again, you're, they're stopping a monster. Some of the time it's really, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's really disgusting to us, you know, and, and we just, you know, we, we want the, the violence to end kind of thing. Which, again, is something I really appreciate. I'm, does... Yeah, that's... 300, the violence tends to be depicted as really cool. So, yeah, and... Let's see...
Yes, that brings us to... Yeah, I'm gonna be putting a couple of video links in the description box where, you know, some, some people that said things that I think, you know, that, yeah, important to say, they said it really well. I'm not gonna, you know, play a game of telephone, just restate what they said. I'm linking to the original videos instead. Now, the unrated two-disc director's cut has the following extras. A 20-page comic, which is part of the full adaptation one, same story as the movie. 24 minutes of behind the scenes. Two minutes of art behind the scenes. Ah, uh, right, I should have just added this up, shouldn't I? Uh, right, the total runtime for behind the scenes stuff is one hour, four and a half minutes, and it's very informational. You learn a lot about how they made the movie. And there's 11 and a half minutes of deleted scenes, not completed animation, but pre -vis or fairly late stage. They're interesting, seemingly only cut for time. And I am just really quickly gonna make a note of that. There we go. So, um, yeah, I, let's see, yes. I rate this eight compelling fantasy epics out of ten. And let's see. Yes, that is it for the review itself. So from here on out, there will be spoilers, but only for this movie. If I spoil anything else, I will verbally warn before I do so tell you what I'll be spoiling and hold up an index finger while I'm spoiling so you can mute and skip ahead and choose to me lower my index finger. So, yeah, the, so the first section is uh, thoughts that I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And the section, after, the section after that is thoughts that I had before this most recent viewing, but after watching the movie. So, that is... Right, so, thoughts, that notes taken while watching. So, the first time Christianity is brought up is during public urination. So, I suppose not entirely... No, it's not, it's not being critical, it's just saying that back then... Like, if you actually pay attention to the movie which I suggest before writing a review, one of the two people talking about it is Unferth, played by John Malkovich, and later on he becomes a Christian. The movie is showing that Christianity, you know, started out in, for example, you know, as Christianity spread across the, all the countries that it did spread to, at first people didn't think very highly of it. And... Let's see. Yeah, and you know, you you see at, at the um, one of the first things you see is this massive uh, pot, I guess, of of mead, you know, and and just the you know dozens of of Danes just drinking till they pass out, you know, and you know, I I get why some people are like, is that completely accurate? And yeah, honestly, uh, it's a it's a very accurate depiction. And I think it was true back then, too, when the movie is set. And we see Hopkins really drunk, doesn't care that his wife doesn't want to kiss. I really appreciate that, like, the multiple times that it's brought up when, you know, I guess, is it mostly Wellfowl? He health? Ah, crap. It's a weird name. You can't blame me for struggling with her name. Is Robin Wright Penn? She plays Wellfowl. Yes, that's right. I, th I guess it is only her, but we see that she is consistently, she does not want to sleep with a king that slept with Grendel's mother. And, you know, it, yeah, it is, um, let's see, she's not depicted as, ah, oh, this awful, you know, frigid, why won't she just give it up? No. You can understand her, and she clearly does. It's not, you know, she is capable of warm feelings. She she clearly likes, um, 
Beowulf before he cheats, you know, and, you know, afterwards, you know, understandably, she dug her keys into the side of his... Yeah, I don't remember all the lyrics, but I think the, the reference is sufficient. Anyway, um, yeah, you know, honestly, she probably did used to like Hrothgar, too. Oh, I um, I don't think I got it written down, so I'll say it now. Something that the, the ah, what's it called? The animation really allows for is that, like, at the start, yeah, uh, Beowulf is, like, 18 years old, you know, and... By the end, he's like, and, you know, he's he's elderly. And I realize that it is possible to do, ah, what's it called? Age, you know, makeup. But uh, my ex-fiance quite likes the movie, the 1978 movie, same time next year, despite the fact that it's, you know, about this extramarital relation, the one, the only thing she really criticized about it was the old age makeup used for some of the characters, and she actually, you know, she she thought that maybe they should just, you know, film it again now, you know, once those actors were actually elderly. And really, the the only thing uh, the only thing she thought of as a counter argument, and I also didn't have a, a good counter argument, would be that maybe the the chemistry wouldn't quite be there so many actual years later, uh, you know. But but yeah, and in this, it actually works. You know, you you see close ups of the the faces, and they've got like all the the I, I forget what they're what they're called, but like signs of aging. You know, just compare what. Beowulf and Wiglaf look like at the start and then at the end. And yeah, you know, once the the uh, yeah, um Grendel, once Grendel has killed a bunch of people in the Mead Hall, Herat, you know, Hrothgar Yeah, actually the the um let's see Yes, I think it's when Unferth says, you know, so we are we're slaughtering goats to offer up to to Odin and Heimdall. Should we also pray to you know Christ? And I, you know, and again, not not critical of Christianity. Hrothgar responds, "Not Christianity. That's ridiculous." But the gods will do nothing for us that we cannot do for ourselves. Which, didn't Jesus say, I help those who help themselves anyway? So just, yeah. Anyway. God, I'm being, a, I'm, I'm obsessing over that as much as that guy is. Am I not? Uh, aren't, aren't I? Um, anyway, you know, he's, he says, the gods won't help us. We need a hero. A hero at the end of the night. And once Beowulf arrives and, you know, Hrothgar indicates the, the dragon horn, but then the camera dollies out. So as they're talking about the dragon horn, Welthau is in shot. And obviously when, you know, because they're talking about, you know, Hrothgar is like, if you, if you stop the monster, if you kill the monster, you can inherit her. And Beowulf is like so so beautiful, you know. So yeah, it's, you know. Technically, maybe they're talking about the the horn, but maybe also Welthau. And she's clearly like listening in on the on the conversation. I really like that. Before we see, I'm I'm going to be referring to her by Jolie or Angelina Jolie instead of Grendel's mother each time. But yeah, before we see Jolie do anything wrong, or her form, which some would describe as monstrous, we hear her speak reason. You know, she tells Grendel, it's okay to kill, what was it, sheeps and goats 
but never human beings. It is not okay to kill human beings. But she does also have empathy when Grendel expresses that it's because they hurt him. And let's see. Yeah, and you know, it's a movie that like in the in the latter half it has these morals to, to I suppose not necessarily morals, but it it raises some ethical questions, you know. And yeah, you know, the the start of the movie is this great adventure, you know, where we see that there's partying and then we see that you know it's it's basically a horror scene when when Grendel attacks, you know, really, is it both time? Yeah, and the second time it morphs into more of an action scene because Beowulf can stop Grendel. But but yeah, you know, and yeah, so so the movie goes from taking us on this grand adventure to making us realize that adventure is this. Um, you know, it, 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 it comes at a cost. And, yeah, after he kills Grendel, Hro after Beowulf kills Grendel, Hrothgar says, Odin be praised, Beowulf be praised. So he is basically deifying him. And... Yeah, I guess I didn't have a lot of other things. Or wait, or was that after... After he claims to have killed Grendel's mother, maybe. Anyway, but then, yeah, the only thing left for this section is... Does Ursula always stand in that one place? Like... Oh, wait, no. She, yeah, she follows Beowulf out into this open area on the... on the Like, it's between two towers. I have no idea what it's called. But there's, like... Yeah, they're, they're walking between these two towers on this, you know, arm... This part of the castle... And, you know, they're, yeah, uh, Ursula and Beowulf are talking there late at night, and then, you know, Welthau also comes out. And then later, Ursula is also stand like, does she just always stand there? And that is something, like, I do wish that the women, <sighs> I, I think that they do, they, they, they make strong decisions, and they have some really ch choice words, but at the end of the day, this is a really action-packed movie, and none of the women really get to do... I suppose I wouldn't mind as much the fact that they don't get to do action, because it is trying to say that action is a young man's game. But I don't think it was necessary to reduce Welthau and Ursula to screaming um, damsels in distress there at the end. I... I think it could have been made emotionally resonant without turning them into that. Let's see. That brings us to notes. Uh, hold on. The final section of the video, notes taken before watching. So, I guess... I mean, Zemeckis made... One more, I think, um, you know, animated film like this after this. And I do think that does make a lot of sense. Um, and there are some good things about the 2009 um, Christmas Carol adaptation. It does some things that, like, and that is, like, if you're going to adapt Christmas Carol in the 2000s, you really have to have an original idea because... Boy, has that been adapted many times, and there had been a number of clever twists on the formula by the year 2000, and I wouldn't say it's the most interesting. It is... I, I don't think I've seen one that was more visually compelling, though, but ultimately... Yeah, but, but the fact that... Let's just say that someone plays multiple roles, and that is arguably an interesting twist, but yeah. Um, and, you know, yeah, ultimately, the, the, these couple of movies, these three movies that Zemeckis did that were full animation and, and mocap, 
they did lead to something and instead of me trying to restate you know yeah there's a link in the description box um i want to say the video is by ah uh, maybe n is it nerd writer i forget it uh hmm that's well, that's interesting i did I really not? Huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, never mind. But yeah. Um, yeah. One of the two links is to a Renegade Cut video. And the other one is... Yeah. It's not the Renegade Cut video. It's the other one where he... Where someone... Yeah. Um, a guy talks about. So, let's see. The... Um, uh, right, right. The IMDb goofs notes that... Yeah. Um, someone noted that it's incorrectly regarded as goof. Though there are no mountains in Denmark, in the age of the Vikings, Norway was also regarded as Denmark. And Norway has many mountains. That does make sense, and certainly, and I say this as a proud Dane, we do not have mountains. Of course, that didn't stop someone way back from naming the 140 meter highest point Heavenly Mountain, as if you could almost touch heaven when standing there. That's a hill, sweetie. It's not even a very impressive one, you know, considering other countries, including Norway, which is close by. Do you hear him? He doesn't even know geography. Or maybe the guy was just really insecure. Let's see. And yeah, so, you know, Beowulf, uh, you know, one of his quotes is, How many monsters must I slay? Grendel's mother, father, Grendel's uncle? Must I hack down a whole family tree of demons? You know, I am starting to seriously doubt your devotion to being a colonizer. You've gone to another country to kill the native people so they no longer get in the way of the other colonizers. Now you're saying there's a limit to how many of the natives you're going to kill? Now, let's see. Right, so yeah, I'm to be trivia. You know, I noted before that the the two writers added psychological conflicts, including the idea that Hrothgar is Grendel's father, based purely on the fact that Hrothgar is the one human which Grendel tries to avoid killing, and the agreement between Beowulf and Grendel's mother to fake her death. And let's see. Yeah, and, and, you know, the entire fight with the dragon, was, originally it was written as a talky confrontation, and now it's a battle spanning the cliffs and the sea. And let's see. Um... Yeah, and, and um, Angelina Jolie recounted her first impression of the character's appearance by saying, I was told I was going to be a lizard. Then I was brought into a room with Bob and a bunch of pictures and examples. He showed me this picture of a woman, half painted gold, and then a lizard. And I've got kids, and I thought, that's great, that's so bizarre. I'm going to be this crazy reptilian person and creature. And let's see. She was startled by her character's nude human form, stating that for an animated film, I was really surprised that I felt that exposed. And I really think that's worth taking into account before you judge her for it. Now, let's see. Um, Yeah, so the, uh, let's see. The, 
the film has, uh, so this is Wikipedia quote, the film has been acknowledged to draw extensively from the philosophy of Freud, Lacan, and Jung, as well as Zizek. In particular, the portrayal of Grendel and his kin appeals to multiple forms of sexual unease, among them the castration anxiety, the monstrous feminine, and the challenging of traditional gender roles. According to Nicholas Haydock, the film reflects the American obsession with sex as the root of all evils to the extent to compare Beowulf's and Hrothgar's portrayals to Bill Clinton and the history of sexual misconduct that con caused his political decline. Nadine Fagali also argues the story makes the point that unbridled desire only causes ruin. Grendel's mother is represented in the film as a castrating, monstrous fe female who threatens masculinity. And, let's see, yeah, and, you know, I already mentioned, you know, she specifically tells Grendel not to attack humans, only eat animals. She grieves for Hopkins' character. And, let's see, while Beowulf embody, embodies phallic power through his physical strength, recurrent nudity, and usage of a sword, all those prove useless against her, as she symbolically emasculates him by subsuming his phallus into the feminine power. This is metaphorized by Beowulf being seduced in her womb-like cave, where his sword strike magically fails at harming her body. And after coupling with Grendel's mother, both Roscar and Beowulf find themselves unable to maintain fulfilling sexual relationships with Wealthau or other women, becoming aged, bitter, and even feminized in their impotency. Impotency, rather. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, in turn, Grendel's mother remains immortal and young, although through her offspring she proves capable to wield herself the robbed phallus. Grendel and the dragon acts act as extensions of her will, mindless embodiments of fe feminine aggressiveness who represent their father's emasculation and loss of patriarchal power. And let's see. So, yeah, one critic, uh, probably a user review, said, This movie completely misunderstands the moral message of the original poem. Or, or, it understands it, disagrees with it, and is making a case for why. This is something that is allowed when dealing with fiction. Texts are interpreted and reinterpreted. If you're an English teacher and you're frustrated that a bunch of students now think the story of Beowulf was always like this movie, you have my sympathies. I just don't think we should run the world based on making everything idiot-proof. Now, let's see. You know, don't don't get me wrong. Obviously, there are things... I, I don't think... Um, yeah. These days, you know, the first... These days, we're dealing with a resurgence of neo-Nazism and a bunch of people just saying, well, maybe... Yeah, I don't, I don't feel comfortable repeating their words, but they are calling into question some things and i think that uh, i don't think it's okay to depict hitler or his ideas you know I, I don't think it's okay to depict them in a positive light and that's you know again there's definitely some ideas that hitler would have approved of in the movie 300 um yeah, the the. I think it's extremely important when it's when it's something like that, when it's a real person who caused real harm. It's important to never be never make light of the. Or, yeah, don't don't make the person who caused harm look good. This was also something I want to say the. Um, the actor Zac Efron portrayed a serial killer in a, uh, oh, there we go. Um, let's see, I forget which, but I'll know it when I see it. Uh, or maybe I won't. 
I could have sw here we go. Ted Bundy in the 2019 film Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil and Vile. That movie has drawn criticism for casting a former you know, male, I, I don't know if sex symbol is the right term, but he's definitely been thought of as, you know, extremely attractive. And, yeah, some people have criticized, you know, have said the movie doesn't underline all the awful things he did enough, you know, and that definitely is, and, and yes, I realize it was based on a book, by the actual, uh, let's see, Elizabeth Kendall, who was apparently his longtime girlfriend, and refused to believe the truth about him for years. I acknowledge that, and I haven't watched the movie, so I'm not saying for sure, but what I've heard is that the people who have watched the movie feel that the movie does not uh, make it... Um, I think it's a problem if you can watch a movie that's about someone really awful and you won't realize that they were awful from it. Uh, you know, and I suppose it's, it's fair to briefly bring up, I gave a very positive review to the movie Jojo Rabbit, which does... You know, th there are some of the ideas believed and propagated by Hitler and the Nazis in that movie, but they're always made to look ridiculous. And Hitler himself is not made to look appealing. Like, there's there's this version of him that is imagined by a ten-year-old. So, you know, some of the time... You know, Jojo, the 10-year-old, thinks that, you know, he, he thinks highly of Hitler. But if you actually listen to the words he says and you look at the way he is, you know, he is ridiculous. And, you know, obviously a lot of things that 10-year-olds think are awesome, you know, once you're no longer 10, you don't think are great. But I would argue that you could show that movie to a teen teenager. I'm not sure I would show it to anyone younger than 13. You could show it to a 13-year-old, and they would still leave, you know, um, leave their viewing realizing that the Nazis believed ridiculous things. The Jewish people, you know, Jews are human beings, and they're just as capable of being amazing and complex as, you know, white people who aren't Jewish, and Hitler... Did significant damage to his country and his people and blamed it on others including the Jews and yeah so you know I yeah I get that if you read the poem it leaves you with a very different message than this movie does I don't think that's bad because the things that this movie makes you think are important and actually relevant. By the end of the movie, it has become completely clear the real source of problems is the frail male ego seen when the king sleeps with a mistress. Grendel wouldn't exist at all if Hrothgar hadn't had sex with Jolie. The reason for the monsters is the fact that you have these powerful men who sleep with mistresses but refuse to acknowledge the children it leads to. Grendel will never be king, because though his father is a king, his mother is not the queen. Neither he nor his mother will be accepted by regular people, and fed by all that pain, Grendel and later the dragon grow and grow. The reason and the end of the movie has Beowulf fighting a massive dragon is because he refused to admit he couldn't bite the head off his shame. So it's the shame just became a bigger and bigger problem. And since this is fantasy, the problem is represented by a monster. Think about how much bigger the dragon is than Grendel. You know, Jolie appeals to his ego, promising him a great future. Now, I am sure that some people would say that Grendel's mother needs to so stop seducing the king each time a new one ascends to the throne, or in Beowulf's case, slightly before. But that 
is her only chance of success. It's not like she can leave the cave and try to marry a regular man, not with her non-human appearance, so she chooses to use their weakness, and at the end of the movie, you know, it looks like yet another man will succumb to his attraction to her. I acknowledge that, you know, you could interpret it as after the movie, you know, Wiglaf does refuse, but it certainly does look a lot like he will give in. Ultimately, Grendel's mother is probably evil, but you can understand where she's coming from. Grendel is not accepted by his father, he is an outcast, and once again, this is density. Come on, you knew I had to make that reference at least once. So that manifests as him being physically and mentally disabled. I will admit, at first glance, it might appear an ableist depiction, but I would argue that it is not. Notice that the people know that their, allow, their, their loud partying is going to upset Grendel. Notice that he doesn't actually attack anyone before they start attacking him. And yes, I will grant that... After he starts attacking, he does hurt some people who are not intentionally attacking him. Like, the there's one young woman who's just screaming really loudly, and to him it feels like an attack. To us, we and, and that's also, note that the camera makes sure to make clear that he perceives it as an attack. He's not attacking her out of malice. He feels like he's fighting back. You know, when they don't do the loud party... He doesn't even seek them out. You know, like apparently a long time passes between the the very the, the party at the very start and then Beowulf arriving because they're talking about, well, everyone is talking about how awful it is. That didn't happen in like a day or two, you know. The the reason that Beowulf even knows about it is because word has spread so far. You know, on account of Grendel's size and physical disability, they fear him. The regular people are in the wrong. They're abusive to a disabled man. They refuse to change their behavior to account for his disability. I think an argument could be made that it is, in fact, criticizing a general society refusing to adapt to not hurt disabled people. Now, let's see... I, d I do think it's telling that some critics thought that the message was that sex automatically leads to something bad. Like, regardless of interpretation, the movie shows twice seemingly the most powerful man in the whole country. First Hrothgar, where it's even cheating on his wife, and then Beowulf, where, you know, after all, he's not cheating on anyone. Having sex with someone coded as the other, and then not at all being there for the son, who, at least Beowulf, is explicitly told will be born. Like... We don't know about Hrothgar. There is some chance that he has no idea that, th that that he didn't know that it would happen. But, you know, all all signs point to that he probably was warned because, you know, Jolie's character makes it clear. Like, she literally says, be with me, leave me a son, and you will be king as long as... This horn remains with me. You know, there is no... She didn't trick him into anything. She made a proposal and he accepted it. He could so easily have run out... Like, even if you say, oh, but his, you know, his, his weapons couldn't hurt her. So leave. She didn't tie him down. You know, she, she appeals to his ego. And we see, you know, and, and that's... The first thing you find out about Beowulf is his ego. He he wants, like he, he says, I'm not even certain we're going in the right direction when they're on the boat, but he needs to kill this monster, you know. He wants so badly to kill this monster so that legends will be told about him, you know. the the So, so yeah, you know, and, and she doesn't, like the the you know she gets close to him and she gets rid of the sword but she doesn't like physically restrain him he could easily just you know turn and and walk away ugly pants hands in pocket but he doesn't and let's see yeah and you know years after beowulf has uh hold on Yes, in both cases, years later, the son kills per people who are not coded as the other. Once again, I interpret that as meaning that one of the biggest problem in the world is fathers 
not being there for their children. And to be clear, you know, sometimes when you when you say something like that, people think, oh, you know, black people, black people in America are disproportionately incarcerated, punished for things that white people get away with. Now, let's see. So, you know, in order to interpret it as men don't have sex with women, you would basically have to think that once a man has impregnated a woman, his work is done. He doesn't have to take care of the kids. That's the woman's job. And if the children turn out bad, that's the woman's fault. And the man just shouldn't have impregnated that woman. You'd really have to hate women and people coded as the other to read that into this movie. Now, let's see. You know, imagine that instead of monsters, Grendel and his mother were instead native people. I figure that if they actually had de depicted them very clearly as indigenous people, Let's see, um, yeah, ra racists would have rejected the movie out of hand. Now there is some chance that they will consider the point it makes. It frustrates me when people say that the movie is bad because the poem depicts Beowulf as a hero and the movie makes him a very flawed man. When the poem was written, the world was a completely different place. Today we don't need to be told that heroes slay monsters. We do need to be told that people who think they are great sometimes make huge mistakes because they're convinced they're great, or convinced that they know what is right. The worst problems today are created by the people with the most power who refuse to consider the consequences of their actions. Climate change, money and political power ending up in the hands of a few corrupt sociopaths of the cost of everyone else. We specifically have to get away from the idea of the extraordinary individual solving problems by themselves because that's what got us into these problems in the first place. I believe that the poets wanted to help. Back in the day, if not enough people unified under one leader, there would be civil war. But when you have a democracy, it's much more important that the people's voices are heard. And that's the big problem in America and in general in the West today. You know, and yeah, America was the country that produced this movie. You know, Elected politicians aren't listening to regular people. They're feeding their greed and ego like Rothgar, Beowulf, and seemingly Wiglaf. In real life, we need to compel Wiglaf to listen to the voters, not with violence, threats, or the like, of course, through activism. You know, imagine if the... the Like, imagine is if at the start of the movie... The the I, I realize I I admit that Grendel himself, it's it's not. It's it's not entirely clear if, the 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 Danes realize that they are, you know, um. They they realize that if they party loud, it will attract Grendel. I su actually no hold on yeah attract Grendel and they can tell that he's in pain they just don't care about his pain actually yeah I 100% so if this movie imagine if they just didn't party so loud and I mean hypothetically let's say that this let's say that you wanted to turn this into a story set today and very directly not only metaphorically reflecting the the issues so imagine if instead of you know let's turn herat the legendary mead hall of of denmark and hrothgar let's turn it into a super yacht and instead of grendel going and killing people they vandalize the super yacht. Now, undoubtedly, that would upset the people who owned the super yacht. And again, to be clear, I'm not saying that vandalism is the is equivalent to killing people, but this is a movie about a monster. You know, like I I don't think the movie would work as well if at the start of the movie, you know, Beowulf didn't kill anybody. Like he he shows up, he interrupts the party, and then he leaves. He doesn't hurt anyone. He doesn't kill anyone. I mean, what's the story? Why would people be talking about it? You know, you have to have something, but yeah. I really love the retelling of the swimming contest. He says that he didn't want to take forever, so he only spent a week swimming. You know, just, 
yeah. It's just a swimming contest. We we have other things to do. Uh, we'll just swim for a week. That's, for, you know. Don't try to swim more than, like, I don't know. What, what do people who are extremely good at swimming, I'm guessing a number of minutes. I, I would be shocked if someone could swim, like, non-stop for, like, just, you know, so, so... Don't try to Beowulf swim. It's it's not gonna it's not gonna go great. And you know he talks about the sea monsters. You know, the, so how many sea monsters were there? Nineteen. There were nine last time. It was only three. You know, and and the later you know, you know, uh, um, be beware of sea monsters, Beowulf. I'm sure your imagination is teeming with them. Just yeah. I kind of love the shamelessness of the design of Grendel's mother. Like, she literally has naturally occurring high heels. And within moments of her touching it, his sword literally melts. She has control over his manhood. It's interesting how wildly different different people have interpreted the movie. Like, some people see it as an allegory where Beowulf is like Jesus. Some people think that it says that masculinity, hyper-masculine behavior, solve the problem since it is Beowulf who kills Grendel and the dragon. Some people think that it's saying that hyper-masculinity causes problems since Grendel and the dragon would not exist if not for Hrothgar and Beowulf having sex with Grendel's mother. Some people see it as pray, uh, let's see, praising Christianity since over the course of the movie major characters become increasingly Christian and yeah Beowulf criticizes Christianity but at that point he's a bitter old man. Some people see it as criticizing Christianity since it features characters that criticize Christianity. Some people say that it's it's, it's uh yeah it it's set out to take the hero Beowulf from the book turning turn him into a fallible man. You know, I would definitely say it's intentional to turn him into a fallible man. I do disagree that it's a change for the worse. You know, or that it means that the writer, duo, or director hate the original, hate the idea of infallible heroes. I think they just prefer heroes who have flaws so that children who want to grow up to be heroes don't obsess over their own flaws and feel like they must not really not be a hero because they're not flawless but instead they accept their flaws see it as heroes aren't flawless beings they choose to do the right thing in spite of their flaws and inner conflict and at the end of the day i mean movie beowulf does still kill the dragon it would have been a smaller fight if he had accepted his shame earlier but he does own up to it at the very end like i think you know, it would have been a very different message if Beowulf failed to kill the dragon at the end. And let's say maybe maybe it's Welthau who kills the dragon. You know, I wouldn't agree, but I could understand then why people would say, oh, it does, it's saying, you know, men can't be powerful heroes anymore, you know. But as it is, like, no, it's just, yeah. And, and you know, we, we know today that if you tell people that their flaws make them basically useless, they're just going to feel terrible about the... F everybody has something about themselves that they can't change. Just pure and simple. Everybody has something. Now, for some people, it's... You know, obviously, I, I realize some for some people, it is... The, the things that they struggle to control are worse than others. You know, obviously, if you have... If you really struggle to keep from hurting other people, that's really that's obviously worse than I don't know uh, singing in false key or something. But everybody has something, and instead of you know, you can have a world where everyone is going around constantly feeling inferior because we we tell everyone, oh, if you have a single flaw, that's it, you're flawed. You're you're not. You you can never be amazing. If you tell people that the important thing is what we do, what we choose to do, you know, if you if the thing you struggle with is that you, you know, you find it difficult not to hurt other people, you can choose to get therapy. You can choose to avoid situations where it's likely to happen, you know, and 
let's see I think yeah that's everything that I had to say so hit me up in the comments what do you think is the best epic story what do you think is the best message in one of these fantasy stories if you like this video please thumbs up subscribe hit that little bell there should be a link to my main channel page one two more links to stuff like relevant playlists as suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now i put out one vlog per week share reviewing and sharing my spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about my spoiler thoughts on the most recent episode of willow and recently the review and thoughts videos didn't come out very similar to this one in other words if you want more videos like this you're in luck you can check out my back catalog as well as catch my next week i hope you enjoyed watching as i enjoyed watching the recording and i'll catch you next time in closing i am film fan game geek